Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Today, joining me will be uh, legendary resource investor Rick Rule from uh, Sprout Asset Management. Uh, he's one of the best uh, resource investors out there. And uh, if you don't know, just in case you don't know who he is, uh, I'm pretty sure that he pr- you probably didn't need an introduction to our show, though. So, Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. All right. So, Rick, first thing I wanted to ask you is in your years of uh, investing in the resource sector, right now Wall Street's completely ignoring it. They don't see a need for it. They're jumping into uh, traditional equities. Uh, is there any point in your history of uh, investing in the resource sector where sentiment has been this bad? Yeah, I think there is. I, I think what's different this time is that the the bull market we had in front of this down market was so long and so strong. The 2003 to 2010 bull market was the best bull market that I recall going all the way back to the 1970 and 1980 bull market. So that bull market lulled us into a sense of security. But the truth is that conditions and sentiment were just as bad in the 1991-1992 bear market and the 1998-2003 bear market. It's just that the participants were fewer. Many of the people that are having a discussion today weren't around in the industry for those bear markets, but certainly past this prologue, and certainly we've been through this before, and certainly we're going to come out of this in the same fashion that we came out of that. All right. And I have a question. In terms of uh, sectors, which sectors would you consider are uh, – the most undervalued are under the radar right now in that's, the resource sector? That's a great question because in order to make money as in the resource sector, uh, you need to be a contrarian. If you're not a contrarian, you're going to be a victim. And going where the other people aren't is where you make money. Uh, certainly, uranium is unloved. People say that the thesis is going to take three years, which it probably will. I'm 60 years of, old, of age now. I've been through you know, 20 three-year cycles in my life. And the idea that I could have, uh, as an example, a three-year double on a commodity and do better than that on the equities is appealing to me. So I like uranium. I like North American natural gas, uh, both associated with liquids and for the longer term, dry natural gas. These very low prices for natural gas are, at the same time, stimulating demand and reducing supply. Shortened supplies and increasing demand means higher prices, and I like to buy things when nobody else loves them. I like the whole precious metal space, not that I think that gold and silver are unloved in the sector, but they're certainly ignored by other investors. And the idea that I can buy gold and silver equities at fair prices, uh, let alone great prices, is something that only happens once every 10 years. These are bargains that you don't see very often. But more than I like gold and silver, I like platinum and palladium. Those are precious metals just like gold and silver to be sure, but they have special supply-demand characteristics that I think make them better near-term and mid-term speculations than gold and silver are. And in particular, as you mentioned, for some of your investors, patient investors, I love the water business. The prices of water have been set by politics, not by economics for 100 years. And redistributing something that was in abundance was something that was easy to do. But now that it is no longer in abundance, the idea that you can redistribute water based on votes rather than economics is something that is going to make good arbitrage investors an awful lot of money in the next decade. All right. And let's get into, uh, I would say, the first one is water. You don't talk about this too much. In terms of uh, water investment, are you talking about filtering companies or bottle companies what would you what type of uh, how would you invest in them i'm talking about water as a natural resource what you find out is in the bottling business that that's a branded goods marketing business and i don't understand it so i don't care about it and uh, similarly with process and technology that's too confusing for me i want to own companies that own water these are primarily agricultural companies that own water as an adjunct to their farming operations You need to do a couple things to be an investor in water. First of all, you have to understand that water is a regional business. If you invested in water in British Columbia or in in Alaska, as, as an example, that would be a waste of time because the challenge up there is to make the water go away. But if you invest in water in places like Texas, Arizona, Nevada, or California, water will come to be scarce. The second thing is that the areas that you invest in, in addition to having to have scarcity, have to have wealth. Certainly water is scarce in Eritrea and Djibouti, but if you have it, nobody can pay you for it. 
but areas, as I say, like the southwest of California or like Australia or like Spain are areas that at once need the water and can afford to pay for it. This is an investment that will uh, not pay off in the near term necessarily. It will pay off when there is a drought that reprices water supplies, but it will pay off in the extreme. And certainly we think that the land-rich uh, American agricultural companies that own attendant water rights will do very well for investors, both in terms of the gradual reflation of agricultural product prices, but more importantly for the reprices, repricing of the water that they have from agricultural to urban uses. All right. That definitely, uh, I've heard a lot about water. And I was wondering, would it be smart for a lot of shale oil companies are paying companies like Ridgeline Energy Services uh, a premium to filter the water. Would it actually be smart for some of these uh, shell oil companies just to store the water? Uh, I, I, I think in that particular case that the technology is appropriate. I think what you're going to have to do in the context of uh, frack water is that you are going to have to learn how to acquire it and then process it and reuse it and dispose of it in a way that is very safe uh, in the context of the public perception that frack water contains too many dangerous chemicals. So in that regard, I think that the uh, play, if you will, is more towards process and technology than it is to water supply. Water supply will certainly be an issue associated with fracking. Uh, but I think that the way to play particularly fracking would be the service and supply sector, uh, as opposed necessarily to the water as a resource play. Okay. So I, I don't want to uh, load them too much on water, uh, especially since I can't – I'm relatively new. I just learned from what you told me right now. But in terms of the commodity sector, I do hear you talking about uh, the platinum group metals. Uh, do you like the miners in that too, or right now is it just the physical metal? Right now I like the physical metal. The reason is that the miners themselves at today's platinum prices don't earn their cost of capital. They're actually in liquidation. And the amount of money that the big miners are losing, particularly the South African miners, and the headwinds that they face in terms of the cost of sustaining capital, the social rents, and the workers' wages, make me very leery about investing in the large platinum producers. The fact that they don't earn their cost of capital, however, makes me very, very, very attracted to the metal. At current commodity prices, uh, supplies, new mine supplies and recycling supplies of platinum and palladium from South Africa, the world's biggest producer, have fallen by 19% in the last seven years and will certainly continue falling. At the same time, the utility afforded uh, by platinum and palladium to consumers, particularly with regards to air quality and catalytic converters, is very high. We believe that the price must rise by as much as 50% to accommodate current demand over the next five or six years. We think that the price could rise by 100% without dramatically curtailing consumption. We like a situation where the price has to rise and the price can rise because on the uh, supply side, the price has to rise in order for supplies to stay current. And on the demand side, the utility afforded by platinum and palladium is so high that the consumers would happily pay a higher price for it to give us the air quality that we've enjoyed over the last 40 years as a consequence of using platinum and palladium in catalytic converters in uh, gasoline and diesel-powered automobiles. I've actually read there's a current shortage of the metals right now in uh platinum and in palladium is that do you read the same thing or are you well certainly there is a concern in the fabrication industry both at the refining level and also in the automobile level in the automobile industry it would appear that there is less than one year's supply of refined platinum and palladium available for fabrication demand on a grow uh, on a uh, on a worldwide basis and fabrication demand is growing an example would be in China, where new vehicle sales passed new vehicle sales in the United States last year for the first, but probably the last time in history. What's interesting about the Chinese market and the shortages that you describe is the fact that uh, new vehicle loadings of platinum and palladium in China 
are about 15% of those in U.S. levels. Now, the Chinese government themselves has acknowledged that about half a million Chinese people a year die of cardiorespiratory illness, mostly as a result of poor poor air quality. And the Chinese government has said that improving that air quality, including the adoption of more efficient catalytic conversion, is a key policy goal. If current uh, uh, platinum prices cannot supply current demand, with the increase in vehicle loadings in China at the same time that platinum supplies are falling, uh, we see much more severe shortages occurring uh, in the three to five year time frame. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to switch topics to the next metal, uh, precious metals. Uh, this You talked about a capitulation occurring. Uh, do you see that in the GLD? We have not seen capitulation from my point of view in either the precious metals or precious metals equities. With regards to the precious metals equities, that is the junior precious metals equities, I see a lot of signs of a market bottom. What has missed, in, what I've missed in terms of a market bottom, has been precisely that capitulation that you described. Those one or two weeks of almost farcical panic selling that marked the uh, bottoms in 1991 and then again in 2000. What we have seen with regards to GLD and with regards to precious metals in the futures market, I think, has been an unwinding of leveraged long carry trades. Uh, weak financial buyers that were leveraged as much as 10 to 1 involved in a momentum trade that had to give up the trade when the prices rolled over and when short-term U.S. interest rates went up, in other words, where the carry became expensive. Those were leveraged longs. You will remember that the financial markets drove the uh, physical markets in the 2009-2010 time frame when the price of gold went up to 1900 The futures markets are now carrying physical markets down as we see a movement in gold and silver from weak hands, these very leveraged long financial institutions, to strong hands, the so-called Chinese antis, the retail buyers who buy for cash and stick the gold and silver away for the right reasons. I think that what we're seeing in the market, while painful, the physical market, is extremely healthy, gold moving from strong hands to weak. I would also like to point out to you, uh, in response to a question that you didn't ask, <laughs> that the price action that we're seeing in precious metals uh, conforms with price action that we have seen in previous bull markets. Uh, some of your listeners will recall the granddaddy of the gold bull markets, the 1970 gold bull market, when the gold price advanced from $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce over 11 years. It's instructive to remember that in the middle of that fantastic bull market, there was a cyclical decline in late 1975, where the gold price, having advanced from $35 an ounce to $200 an ounce, fell by 50% from $200 an ounce to $100 an ounce. The instructive lesson was that people who didn't have the courage or the cash to stay the trade missed a move from the market bottom of $100 an ounce to $850 an ounce, a 850% move in five short years. In my opinion, the decline that we've seen in precious metals prices in this cycle is the same as happened then, a cyclical decline in a secular bull market. And my expectation is that we'll have a recovery that will match the decline. And one last question about the metals. Uh, out of all the four metals, platinum, palladium, gold, silver, just this is a long-term guess. Which one do you think is going to perform the best? As long as you give me the wuss word, yes, uh, I think palladium will do the best in the intermediate term. Uh, palladium has reasonably good utility relative to platinum, but palladium is cheaper. Palladium is cheaper because the Russians were regarded as unreliable suppliers a decade and a half ago when they withheld supplies from the market, and the South Africans were regarded as more reliable suppliers. So fabricators went to platinum over palladium. Today, South Africa is regarded as a less reliable supplier than Russia. So I suspect that palladium will gain market share relative to platinum, although I think the prices of both of them will do well. At present, there are more fabrication utilizations for platinum than palladium. But if the price differential stays the same as it is, and if the cost pressures facing South African producers don't improve, I think that you will see palladium gain market share relative to platinum. I think all four metals will do well 
in a nominal sense because they're denominated in U.S. dollar terms. And I think that the current confidence that faces the U.S. dollar will erode over time, eroding the value, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, and increasing at least the nominal price of gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. All right. And I just want to switch off to another subject, uh, energy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your uh, – you said uranium – probably won't be have a big move for another two to three years. Uh, right now, if you ask me, it has sort of a similar problem that uh, some of the metals have where a lot of the miners can't make money. Correct. Uh, do you think we're at the, the bottom or at least close to it in uranium? Uh, I think we are close to it. I mean, it could easily spike down. But the truth is the longer-term investment thesis is very simple. Either the price goes up or the lights go out. The utility of uranium to users is extremely high at this price, and the industry as a whole is losing tons of money. The liquidation uh, that is implicit in producing uranium for $70 a pound and selling it for $35 a pound is fairly evident. You're losing $35 a pound and trying to make it up on margin. That can't go on for too long. We have adequate above-ground supplies now. When those supplies run out, the price won't just go up. The price will speak. In this uh, streak, pardon me, in this particular case, past his prologue, if you look at the set of circumstances that are in front of us right now, they're very similar to the set of circumstances that confronted us in 2003, 2004. From the market bottom in uranium in 2000, where the price of the stuff was at $8 a pound, those shortages and the panic that they engendered caused the uranium price to go from $8 a pound to $130 a pound. I'm not suggesting that the move that's in front of us this time will be dramatic, but certainly I am suggesting that uranium prices were in stasis between $75 and $85 a pound until Fukushima happened. And when Fukushima took the Japanese reactors offline and caused some of the Japanese uh, utilities to dishoard uranium, knocking the price down, we see that set of circumstances as temporary. Could it take two years? Sure. Could it take three years? Sure. Could it take four years? Maybe, but it can't take much longer than that because supplies will fall, and they'll fall very dramatically. And nuclear power is critical to our way of life in the Western world. All right. And, well, not only that, do you see, at least from what I've read, Japan, their natural gas, they're paying around $16 per thermal unit. I think, I believe, at least my opinion, that eventually they're going to have to turn back on those reactors. Are you reading anything into that? or That's a great point, and the current Japanese chief executive uh, believes that to be the case too. What he has said is that the price Japan is paying for liquid hydrocarbons is unsustainable in the context of their economy, unsustainable. Another thing to remember is that for 30 years, uh, in fact longer than that, since the oil shocks of the mid-70s, the Japanese have had a uh, uh, policy goals of energy security. The only type of energy that has enough energy density that Japan can store enough of it on Japanese soil to give them energy security is uranium. You can't store enough liquefied natural gas. You can't store enough coal. You can't store enough oil, but you can store enough uranium. It's an extremely dense fuel. The Japanese leadership at least knows that at some point in time in the future, they have to return to nuclear power. There's no question about nuclear power in their neighbors. There's no question in Korea. There's no question in Taiwan. There's no question in the People's Republic of China. And the question in Japan will be answered yes. Maybe not soon, but they have no alternative. All right. And the other thing is, I wanted to get, I've never seen you talk about uh, this sector, the Canadian oil sands. I was wondering, what's your view on the sector? Well, I've advocated that American investors who are underinvested in energy uh, buy shares by that name, buy Canadian oil sands uh, in their portfolio simply as uh, political risk insurance on the Middle East. If there were problems in the Persian Gulf, if there were problems across the Straits of Hormuz, as an example, and you shut in uh, the great export uh, sales engines in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Iraq, in places like that, the world export crude price would go crazy. And the value of politically secure, uh, developed resources like the Canadian oil sands would be absolutely immeasurable. 
Uh, I've owned Canadian oil sands in my own portfolio and in my mother's portfolio for many, many, many years. I've regarded it as energy political risk insurance, but it's energy political risk insurance that you don't have to pay premiums on because it pays you such a nice dividend. Oh, all right. That sounds great. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, the trust. Canadian yes, I am. Oil That's correct. Okay. And uh, last one is uh, you're a big fan of natural gas. And I was wondering, is there a fundamental catalyst or is this just a very contrarian pl play? Uh, the latter. It's a very contrarian play. Uh, full cycle natural gas production costs are higher than full cycle natural gas production prices, meaning that the industry is in liquidation. Uh, these low prices do two things. It's happened throughout my career. Low prices stimulate demand. And you're seeing that in natural gas. You're seeing natural gas displace oil and coal uh, in baseline power generation. You are seeing increasing utilization of natural gas and peaking power generation to offset uh, the load irregularities of alternative energies like wind and solar. With solar power, for example, they have to burn gas because the sun doesn't shine at night and people want power at night. Natural gas is also uh, increasingly being used in North America uh, because of its new availability uh, to reestablish uh, baseline petrochemical businesses in the United States uh, and in Canada. So that use is increasing. And finally, natural gas is gaining acceptance uh, all around the world as a motor fuel. And I think this is the sort of holy grail for, the United, for uh, natural gas. So at the same time that you're seeing rig counts absolutely plummet with regards to natural gas, and hence you're seeing out your supplies of natural gas as a function of decline, uh, natural well decline, get less and less and less, demand is growing. Increasing demand, reducing supply, yields higher prices, and nobody cares. It's wonderful. All right, and I want to say one thing also. I just this just popped into my mind uh, when Rick Rule and I were talking about Canadian Oil Sands Trust. Uh, this isn't individual investment advice. It's just our view on the stock and what we do. We're not. We should not be held liable. Consult somebody uh, before if you are good before you buy it. See if you like it. So absolutely, it's uh, a topic, not a recommendation. Yeah. So. All right. I just wanted to make sure right now because I think uh, I believe you're licensed. So. Correct. So, and I don't want Sprott held liable for that Sprott management. So, one last thing: if people want to find out more about you or want to do business, how can they do so? There's two ways. Come to our website www.sprottglobal.com, or call us from the United States or Canada, 800-477-7853. So, all right, sounds great. And as I said, consult someone. Rick Rule gave you where to go if you need some consulting on that. So Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, Rick. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me.